So glad you guys are with us. This is the final week of our series, How Rude, where we're talking about how we deal with difficult people. You guys know the difficult people, like the rude people, the people that won't make eye contact with you, the people that uh, manipulate you or control you, or even worse, do it to your loved ones or your kids, Uh, the people that just are only thinking about themselves. Like, you guys have had some run-ins with these kinds of people, right? Can I see? You guys know what I'm talking about? And we've never been any of those people. That's a whole sermon for another time, Uh, but we're just learning how we can deal with them. And like the video said, like, we uh, are not going to be able to out run them, get away from them, and we want to make sure we don't become like them in the process. Uh, Last week, if you were with us, we talked about um, this natural human response, this reaction almost for us to try to get even and get revenge on people that are mean to us, rude to us, do something to hurt us or our kids, right? It's natural for if they swipe at us for us to bring the claws out another inch and we swipe back at them. And revenge is the normal predictable response from humans when we are hurt to get even with them. And I was thinking just this last week, it's not only natural and human for us to get back with at them for what they did. I mean, this is just sort of what's popularized in our media and in Hollywood. And there's a whole genre of movies where the entire plot is revenge, right? I mean, Quentin Tarantino has made a living out of this with revenge movies. Like, the, you don't know what this movie's about. It's in the title. Uh, not a lot of guessing. Bill is gonna be killed. Uh, that's what it's all about. Spoiler alert, I guess, uh, with Uma Thurman, right? I mean, this is a massive movie. I remember it's like the most blood that I've ever seen per second of a movie. And it's something inside of us in our human nature is like, yeah, he deserves it. They deserve it, right? It's just natural. Uh, here's another example of a revenge movie. I don't know if you guys have seen any of the John Wicks movies. I feel like Keanu Reeves is the same character character in everything he's ever done. And I still love the guy. Like, I'll take it there. There's a bomb on the bus. I'm Neo. It's all the same and I love it. Um, but you see, like, I, and I get down with the plot of this in some way because uh, he's a former hitman. There's a bunch of mobsters that come after him and they actually kill his dog. And that's why he goes on the revenge rampage. And I'm like, I'm right with you, John Wick. If they came after my Laney dog, um, man, I would do some terrible things and you'd probably never see me again. So don't kill my dog. That's all I got to say this morning. <laughs> There's also uh, the classic, it's not only R-rated, like uh, really bloody revenge movies. There's the classic revenge flick. You might not think of it this way, called The Princess Bride. Any Princess Bride fans in the house, right? I mean, like the whole thing that moves the plot forward is, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die, right? I mean, it's the whole thing that's moving the plot forward. You killed my father, now prepare to die. And it's kind of cute, it's funny. It's funny right now in Hollywood, it, it kind of cracks me up that you're not allowed to have characters smoke cigarettes anymore because it made smoking look cool. And uh, so they like ban that and you don't really see that in very many movies anymore. They get in trouble for it. And, but not with revenge though. I mean, because these movies make revenge look pretty stinking cool, right? It's pretty stylish to get back at people and it's cool to do it, but they didn't think that that would ever get passed on to the next generation revenge, right? But it does over and over and over again. And we think inside of us, if we can just get even, if we could just get back and hurt them the way that they hurt us and the whole cycle would end, but we discussed the folly of that last week because getting even and playing the getting even game, uh, you only lose. You can't win the get even game. There's a couple things that happen. Uh, When you try to get even with somebody, they, they control you in a way. Andy Stanley, pastor and author, who's man, influenced my thinking on this stuff so much, he said this. He said, the mean people in our lives can have a measure of control over our lives. Isn't that true? That we get so uh, obsessed with getting back at them and fantasizing what it looks like to get even with people that it, we're not in control anymore. This person that hurt us or that are mean to us they're in control of our lives. I think of it this way. If you've ever had somebody tell you, man, when you're around them, you were just weird. You were off. Like you were knocked off balance. You don't usually talk like that, act like that. But that person you're around, it just ugh, did that to you. I mean, that's that control over you. Another way that this control happens is when you're thinking and fantasizing and dreaming about that perfect comeback or that perfect way you're gonna see them take their downfall and it's gonna make you feel good. I mean, like you're dreaming about this. You're fantasizing it. You're planning it. And they're not thinking about you at all. And do you ever think about this? Like when you get even with somebody or attempt to get even with somebody because they were mean or rude to you, um, you become like them. You start to think in the ways that they think, which are just mean and cruel and vindictive. And you become like people that you don't even like when you play the get even game. We discussed last week through this brutal barbaric story in the Hebrew scriptures about Samson 
that also when you get even or when you attempt to get even, it's never tit for tat. You never just strike back at somebody with the same proportional response. You're always upping the ante. You're always coming back plus 10%. And you can't win this game because it just keeps escalating and escalating and you forget why you were mad in the first place and you don't even know how to verbalize what getting even would actually look like. When we play that get even game with people that are mean or rude to us or our loved ones, you guys, we only lose. It's never evil for evil. It's evil for evil for evil for evil for evil, et cetera. It just goes on forever and ever. So what do we do if we want to deal with difficult people and not become like them in the process? I mean, this is a great question for us to ask because you might be saying, well, I can't strike back and get even with them. You told me that that's a folly. That doesn't work. Am I supposed to just then just roll over and let them walk all over me and then I'll just subtext it to my friends later or I'll talk to my spouse about it later. Like, is that what I'm supposed to do? Just like put newspaper over the mess and act like it's not an issue? And what we're gonna discuss this morning is uh, what I refer to as, um, I think, a beautiful third way. And this is one thing that compels me about the person of Jesus, by the way. Uh, I'm just like a bug to a light to this Jesus of Nazareth uh, because all the time in the New Testament, he would be cornered by religious leaders or by other authorities, and they would try to be like, what's your answer, Jesus? Is it left or right? Is it answer one or two? And Jesus had this knack for always going to the third option that you didn't even know was there that spoke to the heart of the matter, not just the surface of the matter. And so you might be asking like, okay, so what are my options? Am I supposed to just roll over and let mean people just take over them? Or am I supposed to just like get even with them? No, it's not either of those things. There's a third way that I believe um, it'll empower you to tell a better story about your conflicts, but it'll also stop you from bleeding over on your other relationships with your hurt, your anger, your aggression about what happened to you. So I, I hope that you go on the journey with me this morning and you stick with me as we learn about this beautiful third way, how we can deal with difficult people and not become like them in the process, to not get even, but to get ahead in these uh, rude situations. And to do so, we're gonna spend some time again in the Hebrew scriptures, so long before Jesus came on the scene, but it's Jesus, his family, his nationality, the people of Israel, all the way back in the book of 1 Samuel, we're gonna look at the story of David. And when I say David, if you have grown up in church or you've ever been up late watching terrible religious programming on TV, you might think of David as like King David, uh, you know, the warrior king. You might think of him as the man after God's own heart, or you might think of him as uh, the shepherd boy who took down Goliath, you know, with just the one smooth stone and the slingshot, took down the big Philistine champion. You might think of him that way, but we're gonna talk about a different part of David's life. We're gonna talk about fugitive David. This is when you like hear the fugitive theme song from the 80s movie, right, or something like that. But like we're gonna talk about when David was on the run. So to give you a little bit of context where we are in the story, David as a teenager, young shepherd boy, he is called out to uh, take down this Philistine enemy champion by the name of Goliath. And he does so with a smooth stone from a slingshot, one shot temple, Goliath down. He becomes a national Hebrew a hero. And so everybody is like, David is the man. And so King Saul, who is king over God's people during this time gets jealous and his pride is just coming up to the surface. And so you've heard the old phrase, keep your friends close, your enemies closer. Uh, Saul, because he's jealous of David, pulls David into his family, uh, into the royal family to stay close uh, to him. But something unexpected happens. There's this renegade prophet by the name of Samuel. And Samuel actually has the ability to name who the next God to appointed king over his people is. And he says that David is gonna be the rightful king of God's people. So you can imagine how Saul, the installed king, feels. He's jealous, he's prideful, and he's vindictive. He's like, I've gotta kill David because I don't wanna lose my throne. Sidebar, if you're into Game of Thrones and you think that, only, that thing's only on HBO, look no further than your Bible, my friends. <laughs> So we see this whole thing happen, and uh, David, he just takes off. He's a fugitive. He's a refugee. He's on the run from Saul, who wants him killed. And so he leaves and goes into the wilderness. And he, because he's a great leader, he attracts other leaders. And we're told there's about 600 men who also had an ax to grind against King Saul. And so they leave as well, and they become this small army around David. But David doesn't have any protection outside of those 600 men. He's running low on supplies, and he's out in the wilderness, away from the city gates, away from the community in Jerusalem. 
And this is where we enter into the story because we see David and his men desperate for food and supplies. They're on the run. And we're gonna pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Let's go there together. A certain man in my own who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. I'm choosing to pronounce this Carmel because we're all thinking Carmel's the wealthy town, so we're gonna have to split that a little bit here, like Eagleton on Parks and Recreation or something like that. But uh, who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. How wealthy was he? He had 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, which for us is like so impossible for us to understand. But that's like uber wealthy. And so for our understanding today, let's just think, think of Jay Leno's garages of cars, like double that. This is probably what this guy had, right? He was very wealthy, fancy cars. He was like wealth on top of wealth. And we're told it, uh, he had 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. It was sheep shearing season. Everybody would be freaking out in the ancient world. This was a festive time. This was like if you hold stock, it's like the annual stockholders meeting when people would see how well their investments did. It was just like dividend day or interest day on your investments. This is where wealthy people found out how much more wealthy they were because they had stuff that accumulated wealth. This was a big celebratory time. But not only was it a time when wealthy people realized how much more wealthy they were, We see this pattern throughout the Hebrew scriptures where sheep shearing season was a time of generosity, where people that have looked at the people that did not have and blessed them with generosity, with just a portion of all the stuff that they had and the money that they made from not just their livestock, but also the wool from their sheep, and and they gave it to people that needed things. So we're told this is a wealthy man. We learn who he was in this next verse. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, contrast, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. By the way, I think surly is a word we should bring back. It means rude and difficult to deal with. I feel like we might all know a little surly somebody, right? But we're told this about Nabal. He was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. And I think that's an interesting note because most Hebrew scholars think that word Calebite was a reference because the word for Caleb sounds like dog in the Hebrew. And so they were basically saying he was dog-like. In other words, uh, he, he was like snippy and snappy and he would bite your hand and he was always thinking with his stomach. And this is just who Nabal was. He sounds like Prince Charming, eh? Sounds like a nice guy. But we're introduced to Nabal, this wealthy guy during the season where he's supposed to be generous. He's got so much wealth on top of wealth and he's got a beautiful and intelligent wife. He, not so much. We're told this next. While David was in the wilderness, remember he's a refugee on the run with his 600 men and their families. He heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. And so you think David was thinking, idea, I've got one. Uh, Sheep shearing season, uh, somebody that we know that we have worked for is gonna become much more wealthy. And it's also a time for wealthy people to be very generous. And hey, we need supplies, we need support. Maybe there could be a connection here is what David was thinking. And we're told he says this next. So he sent 10 young men and said to them, this is what David's, uh, he told his servants, his 10 servants to do. Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say, it's, the, it's David, it's the rightful king of Israel. Say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours, which is just customary, a greeting of peace in the ancient Near East. He continues on in this greeting. He says this. Now I hear that it's sheep shearing time. Nudge, nudge, Nabal. <laughs> sheep shearing time. Remember what's supposed to go down at sheep shearing time, right? And remember this too, that when your shepherds were with us, we did, not, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. In other words, our 600 men, we took care of your boys when they were out there as shepherds. Like we protected them. This was a time when people would be ambushed from the right or left, especially when it got dark by bandits and by renegades. And we protected them. So remember that as well, that nothing of theirs was missing. And then he says this in the... In this greeting, he says, ask your own servants and they'll tell you, don't take my word for it, Nabal. Ask your guys. Therefore, be favorable toward my men. In other words, think of it like this. Like when you go to a restaurant, you tip the waiters, the waitresses who bring you your food, right? Like be favorable to us. Like we took care of you. Be favorable to us. Since we come at a festive time, Please give your servants and your son, David. David, who's writing this message, is even lowering himself, submitting himself to Nabal, saying, I'm like your son, right? You're, you're ahead of me. You're above me. Give your son, David, whatever you can find for them. And when David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. And then the text tells us, then they waited. And they waited. <laughs> and they waited. 
And it's almost like Nabal is running like a power play, like a negotiating tactic to like show up late and to make them guess and have them sweating, waiting for his response. I think that plays into Nabal's character for sure. And then Nabal gives his response to David's servants. Nabal answered David's servants, who is this David? Eh, David, gross. Who is this son of Jesse? In other words, he knew who David was because he knew his dad's name was Jesse. He knew he was a rightful king, but he's saying, I don't care. Who is this guy to me? He's not important at all. Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. He's like nobody else. I mean, he's just like everybody else who's like usurping their authority. Like, who is this guy? He doesn't mean anything to me. And then Nabal puts the cherry on top of this beautifully kind response, he said sarcastically. Why should I take my bread and water the meat I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where. In other words, why should I do anything kind to this David and his men? It's my stuff. And remember, this is all during a time where it's supposed to be about radical generosity and kindness and he just became much richer and so he's got a lot of cream on top of the milk that he could shave off to a lot of people but he gives this mean, cruel, surly, rude response to David's men. So David's men get this message and they head home. David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. Now, a note about David and his character. You know, you might think of David as the poet who wrote most of the Psalms or he was, uh, you know, he was a man after God's own heart. But David also had a darker side to his character. He was an extremely violent man in a very violent world. I mean, David was known, and it's recorded for us in the Hebrew scriptures, in our Old Testament, that David, when they were conquering a people, he would go in and he would slaughter every man, every woman, every child, so that they were, a people was completely wiped out. And it is barbaric, and it is cruel, but that is a characteristic of who David was. So can you put yourself in the shoes of these servants who are gonna give this message that Nabal just snubbed them <laughs> and all of their people to David? Like, they were probably, like soiling their loincloths a little bit, if you know what I'm talking about, right? They're nervous about giving this message to King David (laughs) because like, how is David gonna respond? Because David just, he was doing something good and then evil was returned to him. How is David gonna respond? Yeah, you better bet that it's gonna be evil for the evil. And David is, uh, he's fuming when he hears this message. We're told this is David's response. David said to his men after he heard what Nabal did, each of you strap on your sword. So they did. And David strapped his on as well. About 400 men went up with David while 200 stayed with the supplies. Talk about an overreaction of epic proportions. He tells 400 of his men, two thirds of his entire army to come on. We're gonna get blood on our swords. You mess with me, you're gonna bleed. That was David message to his men and what he was going to say to Nabal and his people. They strap on their swords. They're going to cause war and bloodshed, and there are going to be people die on both sides because David had an interaction with someone who was cruel to him, who was mean to him, who was rude to him. David was pretty bent on returning evil for evil, giving you evil for the evil that you did to me. I think it's interesting because Samuel gives us this little note that I've highlighted here in this passage. I don't want us to miss. He says that each of you strap on your sword. So they did. And then David strapped on his sword as well. And this is an interesting like callback to earlier in David's story because where did David get his sword? David, his sword was actually Goliath's sword that he took from the Philistine champion. David's sword was a living reminder that God fights David's battles and David doesn't have to fight his own battles because the whole thing with the slingshot and the stone was showing David that God will provide for you. God will take down your enemy. You don't have to out of your own power, your own strength, your own insecurity, fight your own battles. Trust that your God is the one who's going to bring justice to you. But David, he lost the plot. Man, he puts his sword in his sheath. He's ready to go with the sword that was this reminder that God fights his battles and brings justice to him. 
And what I think is interesting is a couple verses forward, just to skip ahead, we see that David is like on his way and he's practicing his big speech, his like brave heart speech that he's gonna give, his big speech about how Nabal is gonna get his come up. And does anybody else like, like when you're like fighting with your spouse or if you're going to go into a meeting and you're gonna really give them a piece of your mind, you're like rehearsing what you're gonna say in the smackdown verbally that's about to ensue. Is it just me? Sometimes I'll be like driving home and I'm like outlining what I want to say and how I want to say it. And I just envision that I'm gonna say it and then people on both sides that are just like halfway listening to conversation like, oh dang, no, he did it. Oh my gosh. There's like this big takedown. Am I the only one? Maybe I am. I probably should go back to counseling. Um, But anyway, like this is what David is doing. He's like practicing his speech. He says this under his breath. It's been useless, all my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. And here's the key. He has paid me back evil for good. I did good. I took care of him and his boys as shepherds and made sure they were taken care of. But he gave evil back to me. He was mean to me. He was cruel to me. May God deal with David, deal with me, be it ever so severely if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. David's practicing practicing the speech and he's not going to just get even. Oh, he's going to up the ante. He's not just going to kill Nabal. He's gonna take care of their entire camp. He's gonna make sure that there's not a male heir left in this crew. Remember how we talked last week (laughs) that getting even and vengeance is an es- it's always escalating. This is what's happening with David here. He's not just going to take care of Nabal who offended him. He's gonna take care of everybody and their children. And this is some brutal, dark stuff. But hurt people, hurt people, right? And this is where David is. He's like riding on horseback with his sword out, leading 400 men to a bloodbath because he's so blinded by his vengeance and his desire to get even. Now, all that being said, let's go to the other camp. Let's go to Nabal's camp. People that didn't really know what actually was going on. And there's a servant of Nabal who goes to Abigail, Nabal's wife. And just believing that Abigail's got a different character than her husband, the servant goes to Abigail. And this is the conversation that we have recorded in the text. One of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us the whole time. We were herding our sheep near them. They took care of us. They protected us. They were kind and compassionate to us. Now, Abigail, think it over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. In other words, I've read about David We're all about to die if we don't do something here. Abigail, can you do something? Your husband, he is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. And so we're told Abigail's response, it's so beautiful, it's strategic, but it's so quick. This is what Abigail does in hearing this news. Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dress sheep, five seahs of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. You've heard of like food trucks? Here's some food donkeys that are ready to go, right? Then she told her servants, go on ahead and I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. What is Abigail doing here? Abigail's got a beautiful strategy because she knows that her husband has repaid good with evil. She's about to repay evil and try to go around the evil of her husband to bring good to David. She understands that, you know, the old adage that the quickest way to a man's heart is through his stomach, or you catch more flies with honey, right? And so she is going to roll out the red carpet of ancient hospitality like you would not believe so that they feel like they're taken care of, that they're seen, and that hopefully you won't take my fool of a husband, (laughs) Nabal's words, to heart, So David is practicing his speech. He's coming around the corner and we see he peeks his head out from the ravine and he's ready to go to war. He's got the Metallica blaring in his ear, ready to like have a bloodbath ensue and then record scratch. He sees Abigail and this is what we're told happens next. When David, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David. With her face to the ground, she fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord. She calls David, my Lord, lower caste lowercase l, all the way through this. Pardon your servant, pardon me, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant, what I have to say. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him, which 
You don't take Nabal off your list for your baby names thing there. It's gonna be rough on the playground for him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men that you, my Lord, sent. And I imagine when uh, Abigail was saying that my husband is a fool, David, like his sword's like here and it goes down a little bit like, ooh, tell me more about your fool of a husband. And Abigail continues on. She says, and now my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, which I imagine David who's got the sword in his hands like, oh, he did stop me from bloodshed and avenging? Like, I don't think that's the plot here, but may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal and let this gift, looking at all this food and this beautiful hospitality, which your servant, which I brought to you, my Lord, be given to the men who follow you. You know what Abigail is doing here when she says what I've highlighted here, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands? Abigail is doing this brilliant thing that all I know is as a man, like ladies, this works on men every single time if you wanna change where the story is going. Abigail is envisioning who David could be instead of reminding him of his worst demons and who he could become on the negative. She's reminding him and envisioning for him, this is who you are. And this is the way that it works, at least in marriage, right? You know, when somebody, when my wife will come to me and she'll be like, you know, you're such a thoughtful gift giver. I'm like, I am? I should start thinking about the next gift, right? Or like, you're so patient with the boys. And I'm like, I am? I don't really feel that way. But then it like, it almost like leads me to believe that I can be more patient than I actually was in the last interaction. And Abigail is doing this to David. She's reminding him of who he could be by almost speaking it into existence, right? And this is beautiful tactic to get David to think about himself differently. And as she's saying this, I imagine his sword that started here is lowered and lowered and lowered even more. She continues on in her speech to David, please forgive me, your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for you because you fight the Lord's battles. She continues to envision to him who he could be. He's like, you don't fight your own battles. You know that you fight God's battles, the things that he's about, and you trust him to fight your battles. So lower your sword, you fight the Lord's battles. And she says, and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, which was King Saul, the life of my Lord, your life will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. I love that phrase in the Hebrew. It's really interesting. There's been so much written about your life will be, uh, will be bound securely in the bundle of the living. It's almost like tucked securely in God's, uh, his purse. Like it's in an old lady's purse, like down where the caramels are and the butterscotch. Like you're tucked all the way safely in God's grasp. But she says, but the lives of your enemies, he, capital H, God will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. She's, you know, she's doing there. She's taking David all the way back to when he was a teenager fighting Goliath. It says, remember that time that like you had no chance standing up against this giant of a man, this champion of the Philistines, but God took care of your enemy for you. You gotta remember that God's the one that's gonna fight your battles. It's not your job to be judge, jury, and executioner for people to harm you. Trust that God will fight your battles for you. It's so brilliant. Then she continues on and says this, when the Lord has fulfilled for you, my Lord, every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel. In other words, this is all going to be over someday and you're going to be king over Israel. My Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. It's like, when this is all over, if you listen to me, you're not gonna have blood on your hands. You're not gonna have a stained conscience. You're not going to look back with so much regret because of what you did. You're not gonna have that regret boil over to your loved ones, to your kids, to the people that you work with because you're so messed up inside. And she finishes and says, when the Lord your God has brought you, my Lord, success, remember me, remember your servant and remember my servants and my family. This is so amazing, you guys, because she's, she's helping him think back through the question that we asked last week. Like, hey, David, when this is all said and done, when this run-in is just a story in the past, what kind of story do you wanna tell? Do you wanna tell a story of like you moving forward or do you wanna tell a story of you being held captive by what Nabal said to you and how he snubbed you? And are you wanna have like blood on your hands and you wanna have a dirty conscience because of how you responded? 
And she puts everything in proper perspective for David. And it was just this incredible moment where there was hope for maybe the first time in what he was thinking was actually possible. And so David hears all this, and then we hear David's response. David said to Abigail, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed, Abigail, for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with what? With my own hands. Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your response. David actually listened to Abigail's words. Can we just come to our world just for a moment here? Don't we all need an Abigail from time to time to talk us off the ledge, to be like, don't push send on that text message. No, 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 give me your phone, don't push send. Don't push send on that email. Don't throw that one comment back that you can't reach midair and take it. Don't do that one thing. Man, aren't most of our biggest regrets in dealing with people and relationships because we didn't yield to somebody's voice like Abigail? And we thought that getting even was actually possible, but it just made a big mess out of things. I know, it's been like that for me many, many times. Most of my regrets are me not listening to the Abigail in my life. And that's why in this story, the only hero, dare I say Shiro, is Abigail. So let's, let's ref, just refresh a little bit on how everybody played out this event. We have Nabal. And Nabal's play was evil for good. David and his men, they did something good. And Nabal, just out of his cruelty and out of his you know, maniacal spirit, gave him evil back for good. And that was cruel. Then we, we meet David. And David's probably where most of us are, if we're honest with ourselves. And David's play was evil for evil. Oh, he did this to me, so I'm gonna come back at him and my claws are gonna be a little bit sharper and a little bit longer. And you know what David's play? It's just predictable. That's normal. That's natural. That's just the way that you and I do things if we're not being intentional and thinking about it. But you know how the the shero of the story, how she plays this out? Abigail's play was good for evil. It's like, I know there was evil, evil here, but I'm going to repay that evil with good. I'm gonna roll out the red carpet of hospitality and kindness and compassion. And you know what? We hear what she did, and that's extraordinary. That like stops our heads, right? If we step out of our story a little bit, we're still like, dang, that's amazing. That's how she played things out. And here's the challenge for you and I, and this is where the rubber meets the road, where this just isn't just an ancient Hebrew story, but it's, it's our story for us today. Like, What play do you naturally run to and what play do you want to run and run to? Because naturally, I think we're most of us, we're just like David and we're just gonna strike back, hit back evil for evil. But here's the reality. Like, I think God is inviting us to run Abigail's play. And if you're here this morning and you don't call yourself a Christ follower, you're just checking out this whole Jesus faith Bible thing. Like, that's awesome. We're so glad that you're here. And Abigail's play, like, I would encourage you. I think it's good advice for you. Um, I think that you will have less pain and hurt if you return evil or you return good for the evil that's happened to you. I think it's a good thing, but it's just advice. But if you're here and you're a Christ follower, you're here and you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus trying to live in the way of Jesus in your life. Like, this is not an option. This is not advice. This is what you have been invited and commanded to do, is not to repay evil for evil. You know how I know this? Because this is what Jesus did for me. This is what he did for you. And if you're a Christian, you recognize that, that while you were rebellious, while you were looking for love in all the wrong places, while you were full of pride, while you were thinking that your own stuff didn't stink and the other people, they were the problem, you know what happened? This thing called amazing grace happened. And Jesus saw you in your rebellion. He saw you in living out a different story and he ran after you. And he showed a display of love that took away the world's breath still today and it took away his breath when he died for you on a cross. This ultimate example of love, forgiving you from your current, past, or future sin and inviting you to live in a perfect relationship with him. 
And here's the amazing thing is that Jesus at that moment when he saw where we were enemies and he was good and we were doing evil, he returned our evil for good. But then he didn't just say like, hey, you should just celebrate that I forgave you and like wait until you go to heaven like and then it's gonna be a bigger party. No, he invites us to then model and shadow that kind of love around us. It's almost as if, and he says this in other ways, it's almost like our vertical relationship and our love to our heavenly father is validated and authenticated by the way that we treat other people. This is our calling, is to not return evil for evil, but to return good for the evil that's happened to us. And you know who understood this so well? His disciples in the first century, namely a guy by the name of Peter. And I love Peter because he's like a talk first and like think second or maybe third. And I'm like that often as well. And I love Peter because Peter at one point was saying, Jesus, I'll never leave you. I'll be, be by your side forever. And then the night there, Jesus is betrayed. Peter denies even knowing who Jesus is three times. And he loses the plot and he books off for his own life. And then Jesus died on a cross, three days later, resurrected. You know what the resurrected Jesus does towards Peter? He approaches, he runs after Peter. He cooks Peter breakfast on the beach and restores Peter and then ultimately reminds Peter that he is called to lead this early Jesus movement. And then Peter writes in the New Testament that's recorded for us a couple letters to early groups of Jesus followers and in 1 Peter 3, Peter picks up this idea from his, his rabbi, from his Lord Jesus, and what he has experienced from Jesus himself. And don't think of this as a Bible verse, but think of this as lived experience that Peter had. Peter says this in 1 Peter 3. He says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Don't do the David play, the natural normal play. He says this, on the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. He says, if you're a Christ follower, you're called to a different story, a different play. Don't play the get even game. Don't play the evil for evil game. No, you are to pay, play this game where people cause you harm, evil towards you, but you return love and goodness to them. This isn't passive this isn't passive, but this is active. This is you saying, I don't wanna do something to them to get back at them. And you might all have that them, that pop-up video thing in your head right now of who that them is. But Peter is reminding us that if we follow Jesus, we're called not to do something to them, but to do something for them. Maybe it's praying God's goodness in their life. Maybe it's at work commending them Maybe in a culture that's so obsessed with catching people doing things wrong, it's catching them doing something right and congratulating them or saying, hey, that was awesome. Maybe it's you, just an act of kindness towards them that's unexpected. But what does it look like for you to repay evil with a blessing, like Peter says? If you're a follower of Jesus, like this is our call, this is the play that we run. Is it natural? Is it easy? Is it better? Yes. And it's gonna free you. And you won't get even, man. You'll get ahead. And that is what Jesus is inviting us to. So here's that question I asked you last week. I wanna land with this again. When you're running with the mean person, when you're, you know, running or your interaction with that mean, cruel, rude person, it's just a story that you tell. When like long from now, when it's just a story in your past, what kind of story do you want to tell? How do you want to tell your kids? How do you want to tell your grandkids that you played it out? Do you want it to be the, the normal evil for evil conversation where, ooh, I said this, then they said that, and then it, things got really out of hand, and now we don't go to the same Kroger? Do you want to play that? Or do you want to tell your kids, like, you know, I didn't play that game. Because Jesus is my Lord <laughs> and he directs my steps. And it's not easy, but you know what? I'm free. I'm free. Man, that's a beautiful invitation. I wanna encourage you to be people that do that. May we be people that repay evil with a blessing. <sighs> that tells a better story. And I wanna be in that better story. Because I love you, I want you to be in that better story too.